Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 27 of the Fair Housing Insiders. Today's topic is on fair housing and steering. Really important topic that we can't wait to dive into. Thank you for being here. We're going to welcome our guest. She's been on the show a couple of times now. Leslie Tucker from Williams Edelstein and Tucker, as well as a uh, consultant for the Fair Housing Institute. Leslie, welcome again to the show. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm glad to be back. Yeah. Always appreciate your insight on such incredible topics such as this. Just to get us going, um, very diverse audience that listens to this show. Can you just give us a little bit of a summation of what steering is and how it relates to the Fair Housing Act? Sure. Yeah. So steering is um, any attempt by a housing provider to influence where um, an applicant or a resident lives. Uh, this is this is obviously very broad, um, and it applies to you know landlords. It applies to um, management agents. It applies to real estate agents. Um, so it's a, it, it applies to a lot of different people in different positions. Um, and the the tricky thing about steering is that your attempt to influence someone and where they live could be based on absolutely, um, you know, well-meaning intentions, mm -hmm. um, trying to put someone where they feel comfortable, where they, um, you know, where a housing provider believes that they may fit in the best or be the most comfortable. Um, but if any, uh, any attempt to encourage or discourage where someone lives in any of the federally protected categories, that is illegal. Um, and you can get yourself in trouble if one, you're talking to a tester, or two, if you end up discouraging someone from living somewhere that they actually do want to live. So it's a violation of the Fair Housing Act. There you go. Nice summary. Yeah, thank you for that. And for our audience, please remember to give us a thumbs up. We appreciate your support for this show. So thank you for that, Leslie. So that's a good overall summary of what steering is. So we're going to dive into a couple of scenarios and get your feedback. And that will really help our audience. Okay, here's, here's a potential situation. So our first uh, scenario is dealing with uh, a prospect who's in a wheelchair and is asking about a two bedroom apartment. The only two bedroom apartment available is on the second floor. So she offers to put her on a waiting list for a first floor apartment. So let's take a look at the scene and uh, we'll get your feedback on that. I love the two bedroom floor plan you showed me. Do you have any available starting the 1st of June? Actually, Ms. Franklin, the only one we have available starting June 1st is on the second floor. But I could put you on the waiting list, and if a two-bedroom unit becomes available on the first floor, you'll be the first one on the list to get it. So what I've seen in, in this scenario, um, you know, honestly, it doesn't seem to be like an unreasonable assumption that this leasing agent has made that Ms. Franklin uses a wheelchair and therefore she probably isn't gonna want to have to go upstairs every single time she goes in and out of her apartment. So that assumption is probably reasonable and, and, and natural. However, uh, what she's actually done here is the leasing agent has made a decision for Mrs. Franklin as to where she is going to live or where she can live. And that is not allowed. Um, that is where the violation comes in. She's made an assumption as to what Ms. Franklin can and cannot do and where she, you know, is going to want to live. Um, that's not something that has come from Ms. Franklin. Um, that's an assumption that the leasing agent has made. So by, you know, not offering the second floor unit to Ms. Franklin and instead of you know, saying, well, I'm just going to put you on the wait list for the first floor. Um, that has now discouraged the applicant, Ms. Franklin, from, from leasing there. Right. Um, and it, that's just a per se violation. Um, you know, the same scenario would come into play if, let's say, there was a multi-story unit with an upstairs and a downstairs. 
Um, and, you know, I've seen this scenario um, just in, in handling cases mm-hmm. um, where someone became disabled uh, during their tenancy, started using a wheelchair, and the management kind of made the assumption that he could no longer live in that unit because it had stairs and the bedrooms were all upstairs. So, um, you know, they kind of made an attempt to have this person transfer to a single story unit. Again, meaning they, they had the best of intentions. Um, they wanted this resident to feel comfortable and to be able to access his entire unit um, easily. But again, this request did not come from the resident. Um, And that's what you have to be careful with. You can never make assumptions regarding what someone can and can't do. And if someone chooses in a wheelchair, if someone chooses to literally be carried up the stairs every day, that's their decision to make, not you as a housing provider. So, yeah, excellent. Thank you for explaining that really, really great explanation and nice uh, visual at the end. Got to leave it up to the, to the resident. Okay. So that leads us into our second uh, scenario. In, in this one, a housing pro- um, uh, the, the context, a housing provider would never want to participate in assisting a prospect to locate an apartment or home uh, in an area with or without people of a certain protected category. So in this scene, a prospective resident is asking for an apartment far away from children. So let's take a look at the scene. And we'll get your feedback and and your take on it. Taylor, I'm an old man and I live alone all my life. I really don't like kids and I like my peace and quiet. Just give me an apartment in a building where there are no kids. Mr. Blendman, I understand that you enjoy your peace and quiet. Our apartments were built with that in mind. Did you know that besides insulation between each floor, our buildings also have a layer of concrete between each floor for better sound absorption? In addition, we have sound deadening boards in all of our shared walls. These boards obstruct and absorb sound waves from traveling directly through common walls. The windows in all of our apartments are double paned to better insulate from cold, heat, and even sound. So although we can't guarantee complete soundproofing, we have taken every measure to be sure that you will have a very peaceful and quiet living here, no matter where you are on the property. So in this scenario, uh, the applicant, Mr. Blendman, um, has requested to live away from children and all the noise that they make, uh, which I understand because I'm one of those people with children that make a lot of noise. So (laughs) I I, I get that. Um, But so even though Mr. Blendman as a single male, um, he is not a member of a protected category, Um, However, what he's done is he's asked the leasing agent to um, basically take into consideration other people's familial status and their protected status um, in placing him around the community um, and and placing them away from from kids and those families who are a protected category. Um, This is not allowed. Um, This is illegal steering. Um, And the way that the agent handled it was actually, I think, very smooth Um, and something that I think um, is a good thing to practice if you do get questions like this. Um, She tried to quell his concerns about noise um, and basically made him try to make him feel comfortable anywhere that he would possibly be placed within the community. Right while completely avoiding the issue of kids. Um, She doesn't even bring it up. So she kind of, she avoids it, she ignores it, and instead kind of focuses on the concerns that he does have about noise. Um, It was actually very well done. Now, you know, not every community is going to have all of these new, you know, noise dampening measures in place. And, you know, a, a lot of communities are older and have thin walls. And so this is not something that you can sort of, just, you know, give everyone reassurance on. Um, But if you do get a question, um, you know, can I live away from kids? Um, Can I live away from noise? Um, Can I live away from, you know, teenagers or young people? Whatever the concern is, you know, you can always fall back on 
I can't give you that information because it's illegal. <laughs> right. Um, it's yeah. that's a safe response, and it's also true um, that you can't divulge, you know, the demographic information of the people that live in your community. Um, and you know, a lot of people who have received fair housing training have heard, you know, over and over again. Well, what if you get this question? What kind of people live in your community? That you cannot answer that. Most people know that if you if you had fair housing training. But it also applies to what areas, what buildings, you know, kids may live in in your community. Um, you know, are there kids that live around the pool? Are there so it applies to areas of your community, not just generally who lives in your community. So if someone wants to be placed in a certain area, um, you know, that's fine. They can have a preference regarding what area or what units they live in but you can't give them any information regarding the protected status, the race, the national origin, the familial status, um, the disability status of anyone living in your community. Um, that's, that can be discriminatory, but it, and it, can also, um, it can also lead to illegal steering. So um, you, know, you always have to be wary when you get questions like that, when you get kind of preferences like that. Um, you know, one that you may be talking to a tester and two, if this is ever, you know, challenged or it's ever brought up in a fair housing complaint that you could be found to have violated the Fair Housing Act. Um, you know, this is a, this brings up the scenario kind of brings up some other examples that I can think of, of tenants or applicants who come to you with, um, you know, preferences um, that don't have to do with kids, right? This is, a, this is it's a common example that we talk about with steering, but this can also apply to other things. And one example that's come across my desk is the housing provider had an applicant who didn't speak English very well, mm. but she knew of other tenants there that did speak her language. Um, and she asked to be placed in a unit near them so she could be around neighbors that she could communicate with, right? So this, um, it seems like a really well-meaning request and I'm sure it was. And the landlord uh, was legitimately stumped when he got the question because he said, you know, I'm not discriminating against her. Um, I would be doing her a favor. Um, I would be making her, her tenancy more comfortable and, and, and you know, better quality. Um, but what, he would end up doing is he would be divulging the national origin of the other tenants that lived there in order to place her there. Um, and would also end up look like he was grouping members of that national origin together in his building. Right. Um, and it, that's, you know, that's not going to look good if someone looks into it. Right. Um, so what I would always recommend doing, if you get a request can my family live near other families with children so they can play together? Can I live near someone who speaks my language so my neighbors and I can communicate? Um, and, you know, to respond to that, um, I would offer, you know, the whatever availabilities, whatever vacancies that you do have and say, look, these are the vacancies that we have. Here's where they're located within the community. But I can't tell you who lives around those units. Um, and you just can't, it's, right. it's illegal as much as you may want to be helping the person. And even though they are initiating that question, they want to know. Um, but you really just have to kind of stick to your guns and, uh, and protect yourself and your company by not answering those types of questions. Right. Yeah. Thank you for bringing those extra examples up because yeah, that just really helps provide such a broad picture on you know, you're trying to do what would be, as you mentioned, that should be a, a, a value add uh, potentially in those situations, but it's still, it's still illegal to do that. So nice way of being able to present those, um, those scenarios and what a property manager or leasing professional uh, should and shouldn't do. So thank you so much, Leslie, for really helping us narrow in on this topic. You know, what is steering? How does it apply to fair housing? And how do you respond to these types of questions? And so there's, there's other scenarios too that 
probably our audience is thinking of, oh, you know, that probably would apply over here. And this probably would apply here. So we definitely recommend take this show and, and take it back to your team and, and just see what do you locally, what are you dealing with? What are some questions that are coming up that you're not act, act totally sure on how to address and, and use this uh, episode at, as a baseline to get that conversation going so that you make sure that you really have an understanding of what steering is and what it could do to violate the Fair Housing Act. So thank you, uh, Leslie, for being here again. Leslie Tucker from Williams, Edelstein and Tucker. She's a partner there and a consultant for the Fair Housing Institute. And you can check out their partner website, fairhousingfirm.com, if you'd like more information about what they do. But we appreciate your insight again. Thank you, everyone, for being here for episode 27. Give us that thumbs up, uh, subscribe, uh, subscribe to our newsletter, lots of different options so that you never miss out on one of these episodes. And we appreciate you sharing this with your network. So thank you for being here. That concludes our show. We'll see you uh, next time on our next episode. Take care, everyone. Thanks a lot.